You're listening to The Pithy Chronicle. History with a bite. I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we bring you history's dirtiest deeds dripping with sarcasm. Are you hungry yet? Welcome back, pithy listeners, and welcome to our summer intra tempora between seasons. Because these next few episodes will be shorter, pithier, and likely sexier than what you're used to. Thank God. With with us. I don't know about your home life. You do you. (laughs) (laughs) To account for no school and crazy schedules, we are taking a break to catch up on our deliciously scandalous content with other less respectable but deliciously scandalous content. It's mistress season, so hold on to your knickers. Wait, are we really doing hot girl summer? Well, not all of them, actually. Oh, good. I can't wait. The heart wants what the heart wants. It doesn't matter. Everyone has their own. You know what? Never mind. Mistress season! (laughs) For the next few episodes, we're going to feature women in bed. Thank you guys for sticking with us, technical problems and all. We are forever grateful for our patron support on Patreon, for the scrumptious coffees we've all received this past week, and for the fabulous ratings and reviews that continue to pour in. Not to be rude, but if you haven't been telling everyone about us, then like, what have you been doing with your spare time? Because we're the hot news. And we're the hot girl summer. I'm wearing my Circa Baby t-shirt, which is definitely prime hot girl summer. (laughs) Speaking of hot girl summer, let's pull back the covers on the bed and life of one of the most beautiful women in the world. On whom pretty much no one swiped left. Mm. Wouldn't it be nice? She'd have like a pimp type thing, but that's oh, less, neither here nor there. That's less exciting. Well, actually, it's here because we're going to talk about it. Madame du Barry, Louis the Fifteenth of France, final official mistress. Mm-hmm. A woman who would pay the highest price for her rise to power, or at least wealth. Born Jean Becu, the illegitimate daughter of seamstress Anne Becu. Jean was a beautiful girl with flowing golden ringlets, dazzling almond-shaped blue eyes, and an innocence that spelled trouble. Her father is unknown, though there were rumors, then and now, that he was a friar, which frankly makes the rest of her life even more ironically scandalous. This is some Abelard and Heloise stuff. It is. I'm ready for it. Mom, Anne, eventually found consistent work as a cook for a rich dude whose mistress just adored Jean. She treated her like a doll to dress up, play with, and admire. Jean therefore received more education than some attending a local convent, but when Mom, and therefore Jean, were evicted from rich dude's house, the two went crawling back to Mom's husband, not Jean's dad, and a man that really plays no other part in this story. Or her life. Mm. 15-year-old Jean needs to support herself. She began her career hawking trinkets on the streets of Paris, followed by the role of companion to an elderly widow who kicked her out when her sons became a bit too interested in the pretty girl hanging around the house. And then she moved up to assistant hairdresser, working for a man whom she was also sleeping with. There was even a rumor that Jean and the hair guy had a daughter together, but it's lost to time, as they say. At least these uh, hawking skills, or skills with her hands, will come back to help her? Wow, with her hands. Really, Erica? I'm just saying, (laughs) a sneaky pinch here and there. Oh my god. All right. (laughs) While the mantra is never mix business with pleasure, Jean never again would separate the two in her life. Jean was not a brilliant woman. Many mistresses that we'll cover in this episode had ambition and cunning and were clever and scheming. 
but Jean pretty much knew that her true skills lay in the bedroom. But that takes a special kind of self-awareness, and just because she might not have been good in the books does not mean that she was not necessarily cutting or, you know, skilled in other ways, and I'm not making a sexual innuendo She there. was a very kind person, from what I gather. Really? She was a very happy person. I think that she had a skill that many of us today lack, which is going with the flow. This is my lot in life, and I'm going to make the most of it. And I think that's something that can truly be admired to decide, I'm just going to be happy. Good for her. She began to work at a brothel and made quite a pretty penny. She caught the eye of Jean-Baptiste Dubarry, who became a well-paying regular. And then, super awkward, his brother, the wealthy casino owner, Comte Guillaume Dubarry, decided to make Jean part of his household as his mistress. Oh, that makes dinner really awkward. I couldn't imagine otherwise. A French mistress, unlike many other nationalities of mistress, if you will, were much more accepted. I mean, it's not the same as a wife, and there was still often a wife, but it was much more liberal in the notion that sex should be shared and enjoyed, especially at this time, the time of Louis XIV, the 15th, the 16th. Should sex be enjoyed and things be shared, or is that just the rule for the men, Caroline? No, the women were often allowed to have affairs as well. Okay. I think it very much depended on the couple. But, but they didn't get an official seat at the table. They did not get an official there seat at the table. There we go. And as we will learn, even official métier sans trite, the official titled mistress, they did not always get a seat at the table either. So Fair enough. Just hold on to your garters. Fine. Because here we go. To the man's credit, he seemingly showed no jealousy of Jean's past relationships and actually helped establish her as a sought-after courtesan in the highest circles of Parisian society. Fancy people, fancier titles. Exactly. Jean Becu, with the help of her lovers, got a sexy new name, Mademoiselle Long. Oh, so she can love you for a long time. The longer the better, as they say. Well, that is quite the working girl. High heels and all. She was a sensation in Paris. Her paramours included government ministers, royal courtiers, and of course, bread and butter, big, fat, rich merchants. And one of these men, stupidly, brought her as his date to an event at Versailles in 1768. Wow, the more things change, the more they stay the same. King Louis XV, grandson of the Sun King Louis XIV, noticed her immediately. And he sent for her express. In fact, he soon sent for her so much that his procurer meaning exactly what it sounds like, worried that he'd soon be out of a job. Ooh. At 52 years old with a dying wife, Louis XV was on the hunt for his new main squeeze. And luckily for him, his wife died just a few weeks later, paving the way for Mademoiselle Long. Did she die with some help? No, she did not, and he did mourn her death, but he had had many official mistresses before. He couldn't help himself, but he did care for his wife, and he was sad she was gone, but he had also just lost Madame du Pompadour, which was his Mm. last official mistress, and so he's, he's ready. Yeah. He's open for new things. And now, it's time to plan a wedding. Mm, to what? (laughs) (laughs) not to king louis the 15th he was infatuated not idiotic no no it was time for lowly jean becu to marry someone titled who would then be all too happy to hand over his wife for the king's pleasure Mm. etiquette required the king's official mistress which as we said was indeed a legit job and title be married to a high-ranking courtier. And who better than the man who made her career, Comte Guillaume du Berry? A fake birth certificate was procured, obscuring her salacious background, as well as shaving off three years from her quite mature 24 years. So 52 and 24 was not a big enough age gap. We had to adjust to 52 and 21 for the sake of propriety? No, for the king's reputation. I mean, Uh. a 24-year-old? Are you serious? Uh, I know. What a spinster. And now, huzzah! Mademoiselle Long 
the former Jeanne Bécu became Madame du Barry, wife of a comte and the number one bedmate of the king himself. Courtly life was not quite what the poor woman, or rather wealthy, Jeanne, expected. She was installed above the king's quarters, far away from her husband, in what had formerly been the king's procurer's rooms. So I guess he Ooh. was actually right to worry about his job security. because Yeah. But while she was given gold and jewels and gowns, she was not given respect. Not an ounce. And she was left to wallow alone. Well, that sucks. Because even as the king's titled mistress, Jeanne could not be seen with the king in public because she had not technically been presented at court. If you go back to our Vulgarities at Versailles episode, you'll see that there are a lot of really weird and stupid etiquette rules. And this is the only time you'll hear me say stupid etiquette rules. I was about to say, tell us what you really think, Erica. <laughs> but if you want to know a little bit more about the rigidity of life at Versailles, you should they check were that out. Scratching the door with your pinky to be let in so as not to offend the king's ears. Oh, God. That would offend my ears. Stop scratching. You're not a cat. <laughs> also, just don't scratch in public, because that's gross. Everyone had to follow the rules, including the king. Thank you, Louis XIV. And Jean didn't understand what the big deal was. Yeah. She was his mistress. Why couldn't they eat a meal together? But no. Until she was formally presented, she was hidden away. And I think this was the first time in her life as a courtesan or a mistress where she was hidden. And that would be very detrimental to one's Weird. self-esteem, self-respect. Yeah. The nobility definitely knew about her, but they wouldn't deign to speak to her or even acknowledge her. It was only her husband who actually helped. Weird to think about, but also understandable because his bread and butter was bread and buttered by her keeping Louis happy. He begged her to beg the king to be presented and, you know, like, get to leave her room, which, if we remember yeah. back, was probably covered in silk but smelled like shite. Louis, however, said he couldn't do anything. Tradition required that she have a sponsor, another woman at court, who would vouch for her. What? <laughs> yep. Hold up. King or no, Louis sends his procure to bring this poor girl to service him, then tells her that in order to stay, she has to marry a different guy, which like that part I actually sort of get because of the whole title thing. But then he leaves her alone with her silken smelly sheets in solitary confinement and then refuses to acknowledge her. But then, but then he says... You need another woman that you haven't actually been let out of your rooms to meet to vouch for you, but like uh -huh. pick one because uh -huh. elsewise you can't come out of your room. But don't come out of your room to get a woman to vouch for you. And she had been married off because of her lowly background, so yeah, none of no the women one... wanted to consort with yeah. her. Yeah. Ex this mm -hmm. is what was happening mm -hmm. to this woman. Okay. But eventually, there was a woman at court who was bribed into sponsoring her. With her massive gambling debts paid off, this lady agreed to introduce Jean to the other ladies who all became her quote-unquote friends. Mm. The whole thing was a farce. Everyone knew it. But eventually, Louis kind of helped to make the introduction. But I think a little, like, come on, can't you help yourself? Yeah. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. The ball was now rolling, however. Her first presentation went horribly wrong. Jean was miserably nervous and actually feigned a sprained ankle rather than go through with it. The second attempt wasn't much better because the day of or before, Louis fell off a horse and broke his arm, so postponed. But the third time was the charm. God, I hope so. Madame du Barry, who is being presented as the comte's wife and not as the king's mistress, and that's an important little distinction there, wore a silvery brocade gown flaked with gold spectacularly coiffured with hair reaching to the ceiling, bedecked in jewels sent to her by the king, Jean's panier, or side hoops, you know, those things that make it so you can't walk through a doorway. They were the widest ever seen at Versailles. Until Marie Antoinette, but we <gasps> will get to her. Despite her scandalous reputation, Jean became the fashion setter at court from this moment on. For the first time in her life, Jean lived in the lap of luxury. Lonely luxury, because presented or not, she still didn't have many friends. Her day began at 9 a.m. when she was awoken with a cup of hot chocolate. 
Erica just get ready to swoon. Mm. She then selected her first gown of the day and accessorized with the royal jewels. Her dresser then came to dress her, because of course you can't actually get into these contraptions by yourself. Her hairdresser styled her, unless it was a special occasion when her other special hairdresser styled her. Mm, mm -hmm. If I'm going on a regular day, sure, my regular person can do it. But if I need, like, the updo for the gods. So my regular person is me. (laughs) So it's, like, either me or if I'm in a wedding, someone else does it. I mean, for me, maybe I have someone to come do my hair every day. How would I get this messy top knot on my head elsewise? (laughs) (laughs) So because we're on the mistress, the mistress train, I will tell you that I know this guy who calls it a nipple do because he's- Oh my God, I'm never going to wear it again. Holy (laughs) shit. It's so gross. I'm never going to do it again. Well, then he'll be sad, I bet. Okay. (laughs) They probably aren't telling girls this anymore, but I was told never let your bra strap show because it could lead to men having impure thoughts. Oh, they're still doing that in South Carolina. Well, there we go. This notion of like even seeing a bra strap leads them to the breast. Well, evidently your hairstyle can Who'd have thought I was wearing it on top of my head? Jean. (laughs) Jean (laughs) clearly knew what she was doing. As mistress, Jean was guaranteed to be the gossip bait. I mean, like, please. Especially considering her lowly, i.e. prostitutional, background. But dressed to kill, Jean made waves wherever she went. And that is sometimes a literal reference because people had to physically pull back to let her pass with these enormous side hip panier situation. But gowns and jewels aside, her life was tough. And I know that many of us are like, oh, world's smallest violin, you have to sit by yourself in your fancy apartment. But it was sad. Mm. Anyone with social climbing ambitions, and that pretty much describes everyone at the Versailles court, wanted her job. The main mistress to the king was a sweet deal. You had his ear and other body parts. And we've learned in many episodes along the way that pillow talk is quite effective and venomous tongues wagged. One bitch, I mean (gasps) rival, Caroline, just wait was particularly furious because she had tried very hard to become Louis' number one, and her failure turned her green with envy. Mm. She went so far as to circulate libelous pamphlets about Jean, and then eventually even the king. Oh. Which is more stupid than me. Yeah, that's but, playing you know, with hey, what the know? guillotine. Not yet. The guillotine hasn't popped up, but we will meet it at the end of the episode. Oh. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. <gasps> yeah. Oh, no, this was not supposed to be a Debbie Downer. Well, it is. Spoilers. Jeanne was, however, more than a pretty face because her beauty was inside and out. She was a sweet girl, remarkably innocent, considering her previous or, frankly, current, depending on how you look at it, profession. She was directly responsible for exposing a plot by one of the king's ministers who, despite Louis' desire for peace, was trying to push France manipulatively into another war directly after the just-resolved Seven Years' War. And she also did her best to take on the medieval queenly role, interceding with the king, begging for mercy, asking for pardon, suggesting leniency. Additionally, she became the patron of the arts, although her taste was a bit like claiming Thomas Kincaid was the next Monet, so... (laughs) Oh, no. But, poor poor girl. But, you know, she tried. And there was no queen at this point. The king did not remarry after his wife died, and she never interacted with the Mm. wife, which would be a very different relationship as a mistress than having to kind of sidestep the queen all the time. Mm. But she tried her best to be that kind, benevolent woman. Sure. The king also included her in state councils, but unlike her predecessor, the previous official mistresses, as in five previous mistresses, just official ones. She wasn't interested really in politics. For better or worse, she preferred jewels to geopolitics. At some point? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to stick to what I know. Or even if I have something to say, I'm not going to help you because you're a toot. Because you're a toot? I'm really trying to. Wow. I'm really trying to keep this PG. (laughs) Don't want to put a rating on this. Anyway, (laughs) Jean was a pretty face, a pretty soul, and a pretty dumb lady. And that included her mathematical skills. Because despite the enormous allowance she received from the king, it was never enough. She was constantly in debt. 
and her spendthrift habits frustrated the court and caused tension with the king's government. Eventually, the king's ministers tried to get rid of her because she was so expensive. Pretty face or not, France couldn't afford her pretty, pretty princess lifestyle. Their plot failed, but it made her life post-Louis very clear. And that ending was well on its way. Oh, no. She was not going to get to stick around once her much older lover died. In the spring of 1774, which is six years after she'd taken her place alongside the king, and private at least, the king began to experience symptoms of smallpox. He'd already had the disease, or so he believed, and thus he sent away the Dauphin and Marie Antoinette, who had never been exposed, but Madame du Berry stayed by his bedside. However, as his symptoms worsened, it became clear that he was not immune, and no matter his previous experience with the Petit Verriol, he sent for Jean and said, quote, we cannot recommence the scandal of Metz. If I had known what I know now, you would not have been admitted. I owe it to God and to my people. Therefore, you must leave tomorrow. So I think I remember Scandal of the Mets. Can you mm -hmm. enlighten it's, me? It's a bit of a rabbit hole, but it's so scandalous. I just have to quickly put it in there. Exactly 30 years earlier, King Louis XV fell gravely ill in the town of Metz where he was visiting two of the four Demele sisters, all of whom had been his mistresses at one time or another, and yes, it was frequently all together. Oh my god! Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. ugh, this is gross! What is it It was, and, and his wife thought so too. Mm. He was gravely ill, surrounded by his sins, literally, and the king feared for his soul. So he renounced his mistresses, begged his queen to forgive his philandering ways, and waited to die. But he obviously didn't die, and instead he recovered, returned to Paris, and resumed his relationship with first one, and then another, of the four de Mele sisters. So, back to Louis' actual death, he was worried again about his soul. He knew this was it, and he sent Jean away forever. Pretty cut and dry. Get out. But this does not seem like I love you or I appreciate you or respect you and I'm going to protect you from this disease. It doesn't seem that way. It would be nice to think so, wouldn't it? But no, that's not what it was. He was just like, you are a representation of my bad deeds, so get out. And now I'm going to declare all my sins and for six days be a pious man before I die. Wow. He's got to think about the future of his kingdom, I guess. Or the future of his immortal soul. Every every religion is different, but it feels hard to think that just saying I'm sorry could make up for all of the women in this man's life. If you go and look up his mistresses, there are six official and hundreds of unofficial. How did this man not get syphilis? It's shocking. Yeah, I don't know what they were doing to... Some to... A lambskin condom? Ooh, we should do an episode on the weird contraceptive devices because that would be fascinating i just will have to be drunk for that because i'm gonna blush the whole time <laughs> so louis died six days later and his grandson the dauphin ascended the throne with the dauphine marie antoinette by his side and marie antoinette hated jean there were many reasons mostly the now queen feared the role of an official mistress and since her arrival in court when she'd come as a 13-year-old over from Austria, she had looked upon the prostitute turned countess with disdain. There is also a story of Jean laughing at a story that was told by someone else, which poked fun at Empress Maria Theresa, Marie Antoinette's mother. But whatever was happening, the tensions were thick. I mean, you just can't laugh at somebody's mama. No, you can't. It's just rude. Mm -hmm. Especially when they're standing right behind you. That's rude and stupid, as we've kind of covered mm -hmm. about poor Jean before. Upon Louis XV's death, Marie Antoinette immediately exiled Jean to the Abbey du pont aux dames Well, that is a little bit farther than the side lunch table by the bathrooms, yeah. but it's good to know that Mean Girls have existed since ever. Were your high school and middle school days rough? So were theirs. The nuns weren't thrilled to receive the king's quote-unquote horror, but actually many of them softened to her over the years that she remained in their care because she was really 
kind-hearted and a lot of fun, and she was very easygoing. Yes, she yeah, was. Yes, she Whoa. I see, I see. Take that out. That's no, it. No, I right. shall not. It's a mistress episode, it's and mistress it's supposed episode. to be scandalous. You're right, you're right. After one year in exile, she was allowed to visit the surrounding countryside, but had to be back by sunset. Oh my god, what a pumpkin. I think she would take offense to being referred to as a pumpkin. <laughs> I mean, with the panniers. Well... <laughs> That's more of a, like a pear. No, girl, there is no a gourd. There it's is more of no a gourd. natural <laughs> reference. There's no natural fruit that looks like that. Or vegetable. She, uh, broccoli. Upside down. It would have to be upside down broccoli. Upside down broccoli. We've we've figured it out. That's what they were going there for. There you go. Woo. After two years, she was finally allowed to move into the chateau that Louis XV had given to her five years earlier. So, like, her home that she legally owned this entire time was finally available for her own uses. Mm -hmm. Life after Louis was, despite the Abbey situation, exile situation, a bit happier for Jean. She was still ostracized for her chosen profession, but that was over now. She had money, jewels, a palace, and freedom. And she also had men, because a leopard really never changes its And good for her. Yes. She had to satisfy a 52-year-old man. She had talents, I told you. Yeah. At some point, she was actually involved in a little love triangle. The Frenchman Duc de Brizach was desperately in love with her, while she was desperately in love with the Englishman Henry Seymour. Whoa, that and I know, Seymour? I know, and I did the research for you. I, I gotcha. He was, in fact, seven generations removed from Edward Seymour, the oldest surviving brother of Queen Jane Seymour, wife number three to Henry VIII. You're welcome. I'm telling you what, everything everything comes back. Comes back to Anne Boleyn. Ah, We need to do another six degrees of Anne Boleyn. Yeah, because we got this. Jean was sleeping with both men, but became a bit too clingy for Seymour, who eventually sent her a knockoff painting with the words, leave me alone, written at the bottom. Like, oh, weirdest, oh, that is weirdest. I mean, I'd ghost her, but whatever. It worked. Whoa. Okay. The loving Duc de Brizac actually proved quite faithful despite her wandering eyes. However, it would eventually be his very head that foreshadowed (gasps) her own fate. Oh, no. The French Revolution began in 1789, lasting 10 years. And this is not an episode about the French Revolution. But just to say, during this time, radical political and societal changes rocked France. And while many of its fundamental principles are considered the cornerstones of today's notion of liberal democracy... It was a deadly time for anyone associated with rank and wealth. In 1792, innocent Jean heard a ruckus outside her chateau, and she looked through the window only to see the Duc de Brizac's severed head, freshly bloodied, hauntingly hanging outside her window. Oh my god. That's, oh my god. Mm-hmm, that would be freaky. That's a horror story. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That same year, Jean discovered that her Bengali slave, Zamor, had joined the political club Jacobin. Zamor had been given, yes, given, to her by Louis XV, and she had treated the man like a doll, dressing him up in fine silks. She had also educated him, and I believe that she felt they were very close. But it was this man that would be her downfall. You cannot be friends with someone you own. You're right, you can't. But she didn't understand that because Jean had always been kind of owned herself. Yeah. And it did not bother her, I think. And of course, I can't speak for her true emotions. But seemingly based on her personality and her outgoing attitude, first of all, it's not the same as slavery. But second of all, it did not seem to affect her in the way that, like, it would affect me. Since she had been kind of a pawn of every man around her, she, I think, probably felt more comfortable in the Mm -hmm. in the company of of another person who did not have the freedom of a duke or a count or a king and i think that's why she didn't get along with people at court she was a possession even though there were no papers exactly because many of the other titled mistresses were of the nobility in fact she was really one of the few that wasn't right it put her on a different level even than a titled mistress who had always had money and wealth Mm -hmm. and understood 
Versailles etiquette and things like that. Ugh. So I think she felt that she and Zamor had a larger a bond. A yeah. kinship between them. But he did, did not. No. Zamor had become more and more politically radical, which as a slave that was owned by someone of the nobility makes a lot of sense. Mm. And therefore he became But also dangerous. <laughs> dangerous, exactly. Jean, despite her disinterest in politics, did worry about his new set of friends. And she questioned him. And eventually, even she decided he wasn't safe and gave him three days notice. But obviously, those of us with a slightly larger brain would know that that's not the brightest idea. Because Mm -hmm. Zamor now felt entirely free to hand her over to the murderous revolutionaries. Yeah. He promptly denounced his mistress and his mentor basically made it his life's work to murder Jean from that moment on. Quickly, she was arrested and charged with financially assisting immigres fleeing the revolution, which was true. She had given what she could to help former friends from court escape the deadly guillotine. And again, she is a nice person because many of these friends had not been kind to her, and yet she did her best to assist them. Mostly on Zamor's testimony, Jean was accused of treason by the Revolutionary Tribunal of Paris, convicted and condemned to death. In a last-ditch effort, she tried to barter away her hidden gemstones in exchange for her life, but she failed because she just told them where they were, and they were like, great, still gonna die. Mm. Again, not the brightest bulb in the box. On December 8th, 1793, Madame du Barry was dragged to the guillotine. On the way, she collapsed, crying out, You're gonna hurt me? Why? Oh dear. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> Girl just didn't get it. Like, That's listen, that is a bless your heart if I've ever heard one. All the way up the stairs to the platform, she screamed for mercy, begging the raucous crowd for help. Again, this crowd was here to see her executed. What did she think they were going to do? And as her head was forced onto the block, she turned to her executioner. De grâce, Monsieur le Baron, encore un petit moment. One more moment, Mr. Executioner, I beg you. To which he replied by dropping the blade, slicing through her streaming golden ringlets, severing her head clean off. Whoa. Plop. Crap. Mm -hmm. That's the life Mm -hmm. and death. Especially the death of Madame du Berry, Louis XV's final official mistress, number six. Jeanne was born to nothing and rose to everything, but her influence, her significance were slight. The innocence of her dazzling blue and almond eyes was reflected in her soul, and she was a woman with few skills, but made the most Uh of what she was given. Uh It's perhaps her innocence that made her such an attractive final mistress for a king whose reign was heavy and long. It was second only to his grandfather's, who is the longest ruling monarch in the Western world, including Elizabeth II. The role of mistress is as varied as their backgrounds. Some, like Jean, come from nothing and offer companionship and happiness for their kings. Others, like Roxelana, the subject of our first ever episode, hold such power and sway that the sultan himself will upend centuries of tradition just to keep her by his side. Some mistresses love their partners and others despise them. So did she have a seat at the table? I don't think she did. I don't think she wanted one, though. And I think even though it was a choice made out of maybe ignorance and desire not to be involved, I still think it was a powerful choice. I think she didn't want to ruffle feathers. While she felt secure in her gowns, I think she didn't feel secure at the court of Versailles. Yeah. And she was number six of his official mistresses. So you know where you stand at that point. You've seen that no one lasts forever. This guy is not going to be Suleiman that changes the world for one woman. That's not right. Louis XV's style. So I think she read the room. Yeah. She was not going to get this seat at the table. So why bother begging for it or manipulating for it? Why not just be as she was? go with the flow. Even though that might seem antithetical to our women at war who've been fighting and who Uh are such world changers, it's still a powerful choice. There is power in choosing path of least resistance. And she changed her world. God knows that's true. And she changed her world, which was all she really needed and wanted. 
And with that, I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we are Pithily Yours. This episode is brought to you by the Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!